To me, I won't invest in a company unless I think that it has a moat or a competitive advantage, some factor that's going to keep its profits protected from the inevitable forces of competition. Uh, if a company is out there and they have a hit product of some kind and they're making money. I brought you back because I've been spending all this time in the macro world recently. And I thought it'd be fun to kind of dive back into the micro a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about valuation, a couple of things around metrics, but then also some stock picks. I just thought it'd be good to kind of see what the market's offering up nowadays. There's a few interesting picks out there that you've done a bunch of research on that I wanted to dig into. So I'm excited to have you on the show. And one of the things I learned from you very early on is the idea that the price to earnings ratio may not be all it's hyped up to be. <laughs> or, or should I say that it's only relevant some of the time? And that's really stuck with me. I've been putting that into to practice ever since we first spoke about it. But I'd like to provide the audience an opportunity here to, to learn exactly about what you mean about the price, of, price to earnings ratio. And actually, maybe the first time you realized it wasn't maybe your primary focus. Yeah, sure. So uh, the PE ratio is one of my favorite valuation metrics to use. Uh, the unfortunate thing about the PE ratio is that there are many, many, many cases when the PE ratio is just absolutely useless as a tool for figuring out what a company is worth. Uh, my first, the first time I, I really realized this uh, was in the early part of the 2010s, uh, because I vividly remember the year was 2006. And at the time, the company that I was working for had just switched our software to this amazing new cloud-based tool called salesforce.com. And I, uh, as an employee, I got access to this software and I immediately was like, wow, this is so much better than what we had before. I mean, I was just instantaneously blown away with how this software uh, worked. So at the time I was new to investing um, and I went to see, hey, I wonder if this company is publicly traded. Lo and behold, it was. And I was like, I love, I love the software. This, it, uh, like our company would literally shut down if this software start, stopped working. It's that important. And I was like, I wonder, I wonder what the, what the, the company is trading at. Well, I looked up and I knew enough about valuation to know that a very high PE ratio was just like an automatic don't buy. And at the time, this was 2006, Salesforce.com's PE ratio was 160. And I was like, isn't the market like 15 or 20? So is this company really eight times the value of the market in general? So it was the first time when I looked at a company, knew the PE ratio, and just instantaneously passed, right? Way too expensive, can't buy this thing. Um, and if you followed salesforce.com at all, you probably know that this has been a tremendous winner. In fact, from that 160 PE ratio that I passed at, the stock is currently up 2,250%. So I am currently, I've missed out on a 20X return on this company that I had insights into very early on as a customer, but I passed on simply because the PE ratio was too high. And that's not the only stock that this has happened to me on. This is one that um, just stings the most because the PE ratio really led me astray. Well, you are not alone. Let me just uh, assure you there because I, I've definitely made that exact same mistake. And I know our, our good friend, Morgan Housel, has done a lot of cool research around this. He's actually provided this chart where he showed exactly the PE ratio you would have bought a company at to get the market return of around 8%. And you would be so surprised, right? Over, I forget exactly the timeline. I think it was 2000, early 2000s to 2012, something in that vein. But some of the stocks on there at the time were listed pretty highly, you know, maybe over 20, but you would actually have bought it at 40, you know, just to get a market uh, return. So it's, it's just really interesting. So not to say it's not relevant. Like I said earlier, there, there are times where it makes sense. So what are the phases of a company's growth in which Maybe it's less relevant and then where it becomes relevant. Yeah, Trey, that table that you're referring to blew me away the first time that I, I saw it. And for those that are listening, uh, what this chart showed was the actual PE ratio of the Dow components uh, in 1995. 
And then the PE ratio that a willing investor should have been willing to pay in 1995 to earn a market matching uh, return. And some of the ones that stick out um, uh, during this time period um, is a company such as um, Home Depot. Uh, in 1995, Home Depot was trading at 36 times earnings. In no world would you call that PE ratio uh, cheap. Uh, and yet, even though it was trading at 36 times earnings, it smashed the market's return. So much so that investor could have been willing to pay 77 times earnings for Home Depot in 1995, and they still would have earned a market uh, matching r return. Uh, conversely, in 1995, Alcoa was trading at 10 times earnings, a cheap number, a low number in absolute terms. And yet to earn an 8% return in 1995 on Alcoa, you would have had to bought the company at three times earnings. So in other words, Alcoa at 10 times earnings in 1995 was incredibly overvalued. And Home Depot at 36 times earnings in 1995 was incredibly undervalued. And the table just really hammers home the point about how valuation is really, really important in the short term. But what truly matters in the long term is, did you buy a great company or not? And there's actually some research even around this, uh, an extensive amount of research around this, primarily from Morgan Stanley. So why don't you walk us through this chart? And for th those listening, you can just hear the percentages that Brian will show up. But this will really, I think, help provide a great example of what we're talking about here. Yeah. So over a 20-year period from 1990 to 2009, Morgan Stanley and BCG uh, analysis did some research about what is the factor that leads to stock market performance? What is the factor that drives a stock higher uh, over various periods uh, of time? And they actually quantified uh, the results. Uh, what their analysis showed that was over a one-year period, the number one driver of stock market uh, of returns of a stock was the multiple valuation, the PE ratio. In other words, if you want to outperform in the short term, you better buy at the right valuation, right? You buy a low valuation that expands, you're up. You do the reverse, you're down. However, what the same study showed is that the longer your holding period, the less and less and less important that valuation becomes. In fact, the biggest, the number one driver of stock valuation return, stock returns over a 10 year period by far is revenue growth. Revenue growth accounted for 74% of the outperformance of a stock over a 10-year period. And over that same period, the changes in the multiple, the changes in valuation, only accounted for 5% of that growth. And what that really hammers home to me is in the short term, valuation is everything. But in the long term, it's really the quality of the business that shines through. Essentially saying that the stock price is tied to its earnings over time. It, and, and it goes back to that Ben Graham quote about it being a, the stock market being a voting machine in the short term, but a weighing machine in the long term. And I think this is exactly what he was intuitively talking about back then in the 40s. <laughs> so, um, so just to tie the knot on that point, there are phases of when we should focus on valuation in a company's growth cycle. Right. So maybe give a couple of examples of companies either today or in your experience where it's been less relevant and then become more relevant when you're assessing the stock. Yeah. So this depends on the company that you're, you're talking about. Um, but by, by and large, um, I, I created a, a chart uh, that basically walks through the various phases that a, a very successful growth company goes through on its way from being founding uh, all the way to making its way into the S&P 500 and then falling out and fading away into uh, uh, obscurity. So when a company is founded, uh, there are no financial statements to look at, right? There's no revenue, there's no sales, there's no margins, there's no anything. All you have is an idea. Uh, at that point, what is the company's price to earnings ratio? It's infinite. There are no earnings to, 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 to measure. Uh, but was it a good idea to invest in Apple and Google and Microsoft and Intel, et cetera, at their founding? You bet it was. So the PE ratio is useless when a company is founded. Uh, after a company gets started, uh, it's very common for those companies to be in very fast growth mode, right? They've, they've clearly nailed and demonstrated product market fit. And all of the company's energy and resources are devoted to growing the top line higher, adding customers, capturing market share, executing on the opportunity that they see of them. 
it's very common for companies that are in this stage uh, to be running off of venture capital or investor funds and to be outspending their own sales growth because their, their focus is capturing market share. So it's very common in companies that are in the launch and hyper growth stage to be losing money. Now, is the PE ratio useful in this stage? Well, no, there's no earnings. There's no E, so the PE ratio is absolutely useless uh, in, in this stage. Eventually, as the company grows and the company scales, there becomes a tipping point when it goes from losing money to reaching break even and starting to make a little bit of money. At this point, the company goes from not having earnings to having earnings. And when you're looking at a company in its hyper growth stage, when again, the top line is still the focus, it's very common for the earnings power of the company, the true earnings power of the company to be severely understated. Again, because all the company's resources are devoted to the top line growth. So companies in this stage do have a PE ratio. However, that PE ratio is often 1,000 or 500 or, or 100 because the earnings power of the business is so depressed because it's not the focus. However, eventually, a company real, uh, realizes all of the gains of scale and does start to focus on bottom line profitability, starts to generate bottom line uh, earnings. It's only when a company reaches true operating scale and is fully optimized for profits that the earnings power of the business shines through. And this is finally the stage when the P-E ratio becomes meaningful. The trouble that investors get into and the mistake that I made on salesforce.com all those years ago was I was using the PE ratio, which is a great ratio for judging mature companies to judge a hyper growth uh, a company. This is why for the last 20 years, people have been screaming about the PE ratios of fill in the bank growth stock, right? Amazon, uh, Tesla, uh, Netflix, et cetera. All of them have had sky high PE ratios because their true earnings power has not been demonstrated in the financial statements. So it's just a mistake, a common mistake that a lot of investors make when they only look at the PE ratio is they're using this metric that isn't yet meaningful at the wrong time. So when we are assessing a company earlier in its life cycle, what are some of your go-to metrics that you do like to focus on if it's not the PE ratio? So it depends on the stage that the company is in. And there are, in many cases, in some cases, there are no good, good answers. Uh, however, um, you have to, I, I like to think of it through the way that the income statement works. So the income statement starts with revenue and it flows all the way down to, to net income, right? So net income earnings uh, is the bottom line. And when a company is fully optimized up and down the income statement, that's when the PE ratio becomes useful. However, if that number is not currently useful, you're kind of forced to go higher up the income statement along the way to account for those factors. So prior to the PE ratio becoming useful, sometimes you have to go to price to EBITDA, which is not a metric that I like, even though a lot of management teams tout that number um, like, like crazy, but that's because everything below uh, the EB, 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 EBITDA um, is... is um, hiding the true earnings power of the business. Uh, prior to that, uh, if even if a company isn't optimized for EBITDA, sometimes you have to go one step higher. And the, the number higher than there is called gross profit. So it's revenue minus cost of goods sold. And a metric that I often look at is called the price to gross profit uh, ratio. If a company's gross margin is optimized, uh, I actually think the price to gross profit ratio oftentimes is more useful than the more commonly known price to sales uh, ratio. And, but if a company isn't optimized for gross profit, you do have to go one step higher and you have to look at the price to sales ratio. In general, the earlier the company is in its growth phase, the higher you have to go on its income statement to judge the valuation uh, of a company. So that is one way to think about how to value companies depending on the growth stage that they're in. I love that. That's such a great, thank you for that. In your opinion, what do you think is the number one most important attribute to be focused on when you're determining to invest in a company or not, maybe irregardless of its life cycle stage? Well, I think the Buffett quote says it, says it best, and I'm going to virtue it, but I know that it's, it's there. It says, when the key to assessing uh, a business isn't how fast it's going to grow, the key to thing to think about is the company's competitive advantage and above all, the durability of that ad advantage. 
Uh, to me, I won't invest in a company unless I think that it has a moat or a competitive advantage, some factor that's going to keep its profits protected from the inevitable forces of competition. Uh, if a company is out there and they have a hit product of some kind and they're making money, uh, you can be sure that eventually uh, competitors will crop up that says, hey, I want a piece of that. They'll offer the same product or service, sometimes for less in order to capture market share and in order to compete and to maintain uh, your market share, companies often lower prices to, to, to maintain their customers. Doing so is hugely detrimental to the profitability of a business. Um, so to me, I won't invest in a company unless I believe that it a, has a moat, or B, is actively building out a moat for itself. When people think about moats, there's a lot of things that come to mind. Management, great product, you name it. What are some things, in your opinion, you would categorize as something as a somewhat of a fake moat, meaning it's, it's perceived as a moat, but over time, maybe it loses its relevance? Yeah, a few of them come to mind. Uh, one of the more popular fake moats that I've seen in the past is a popular product. So a product is the latest, shiniest thing of the day, and demand for that product seems to be going nowhere but up over a short period of time. And these are actually really, really tricky uh, to, to spot in real time, because if you're just looking at the financial statements, oftentimes they look awesome. They look really great. Revenue's heading in the right direction. Margins are good. Profits are growing up. Uh, however, if that product is just temporarily popular, not permanently uh, popular, that can be a fake moat. Uh, in recent history, I would say a couple good examples of that would be products like GoPro. I remember when GoPro came public a few years ago, their growth looked outstanding, um, but then they quickly saturated their, their market and they were forced to... Um, uh, slash prices at retailers are to drive product sales. So that I think was a fake moat. Another one was a uh, Fitbit, or perhaps more recently, you could say Peloton had a, has a, has a fake moat, uh, given the enormous demand they saw in, in uh, 2019 and 2020 that immediately evaporated once people had that, or even in the fashion uh, industry. I remember a couple of years ago, a company called Michael Kors came public. And at the time that brand was red hot, like everything was going well uh, for that business. But slowly that brand faded, faded away, no, lost its relevance and profits and revenue did too. So just because a, pro a product is popular doesn't automatically mean that a moat is being built. One thing I really love about your style is you have a very clear and in investing regimen and you follow it, a, you follow a checklist and you do a, a number of things that set you up for success, which ultimately leads to having this investing thesis, which I think a lot of people just don't actually have uh, when they go into stock. So the reason why that's so important is that you have to know when your thesis is busted. And I'm just going to use this example because I don't know if you're invested in this or if, if you've even got a thesis around it, but Shopify, for example, fast growing company. And we saw this huge ramp up in their stock price and their business just when COVID hit because e-commerce, the, the demand got kind of pulled forward quite a bit. And during that time, you, you can't really blame the management for this, but they went really big, right? They, I think they put a hundred million or so into R&D and they, they went from a positive earnings to a negative earnings over the last quarter that just came out. So I'm curious, when you see stuff like that, is that a thesis buster or is that just sort of par for the course in the long roadmap of a, of a positive company? Yeah, what we've seen over the last couple of years has been extraordinary, uh, right? In, in 2020, companies like Shopify had more business and more demand than they knew what to do with. They just foresaw this huge bolus of people ordering online like never before. And those management teams at companies like Shopify, companies like uh, Etsy, companies like Amazon saw that demand and bet big immediately to fulfill that demand. So we saw many of those companies just invest hugely in their own capital expenditures to fulfill the extreme demand uh, that they've seen. 
the bet that they were making was that that, that will be the new uh, rate of demand for e-commerce products uh, indefinitely. Unfortunately, what we've seen over the last six months or so is that all of those shoppers that were forced to go online have since returned in a large way to shopping uh, back in stores. And the growth rate of many of those e-commerce companies have come plunging uh, down. And now those companies essentially overbet. They overbuilt. They have way too much capacity. When you have too much capacity and that demand that you're betting on doesn't come through, that does awful things to your income statement uh, in, in the short term, right? And those businesses are being forced to right size their businesses in order to fulfill the actual demand, not the demand that they uh, thought. So companies like Amazon, companies like uh, Shopify, clearly overbuilt and overhired. And now we're seeing the reverse of that where they're, um, where they're actually laying off uh, people in light of the, of the small demand. So the question that I try and ask myself uh, when I see something like that is, okay, is, is the thesis for owning the stock busted or did the expectations for the company seem to get out of hand? When I look at Shopify's recent results, the bottom line losses and them saying layoffs are coming are not pleasant to see. But I also see that Shopify grew its revenue 16% in its awful, god-awful, terrible quarter. 16% growth on top of extreme hypergrowth in the prior year. Uh, in fact, their three-year revenue growth rate is 53%. Um, so when I see the company is still growing its revenue at a double digit rate today off of those extremely high uh, comparisons from the year ago a period, I don't think that the thesis is busted uh, for Shopify. I think that the management team overbuilt out, has admitted its error, and is now pulling back. Um, conversely, when I see the demand destruction at a company like Peloton, uh, Peloton is really saying uh, canceling uh, orders, and that company is seeing its revenue declining. Margins are hugely under pressure, and they're trying to do all kinds of, uh, of things. With a company like Peloton, if you bought a Peloton two or three years ago, why do you need to buy another one? Right, so they they actually need new consumers to come in to buy their expensive devices to use them in house when the demand for that product in general is evaporating. So when I look at the difference between Peloton and Shopify, Shopify, I still think the thesis is on track, uh, although I could be proven wrong uh, in time. But a company like Peloton, I would be much more willing to say I was wrong and sell and learn a lesson. Is there any period of grace you give these companies that you've determined in advance that? two consecutive quarters in a row? Do you give them some forgiveness and then let them come back and prove it? Or what's your kind of take on when it is time to say, okay, this thesis is busted? So the, the thesis for Shopify all along for many, many years has been uh, growth in e-commerce generally. Shopify makes it super easy to set up a site. And importantly, a lot of small businesses are going to prefer to own their own distribution through a company like Shopify as opposed to renting it on places like Amazon. And I think it's been well publicized that Amazon, uh, for all the great things that it does, sees products that are working well, says, yes, please, I'll take that. And they effectively compete against against their own customers. By contrast, Shopify does not do any uh, of that. So if I was a small business, I would be reluctant to list on Amazon and I would really try and use Shopify. That difference in positioning, I think actually gives Shopify a durable competitive advantage over the likes of Amazon. Um, so that is the large thesis for this, that Shopify is a diversified way to play the broad-based growth in the internet around the world. As far as I can tell, the thesis for that is still firmly on track. So I expect the next year or so to probably be pretty rough uh, for, for Shopify, but I don't invest over short-term periods of time. The thesis is where is Shopify going to be in 2030? I still think the answer is much bigger than it is today. And it does look like they're chasing the heels of Amazon a little bit by building out more and more of their distribution so they can deliver to customers and not have to rely on third parties as much. There's been some recent deals around that. To that point though, as someone who does sell product on Amazon and Shopify, I can tell you that there's an interesting dynamic playing out here where a lot of customers, although they might not buy on Amazon, they still use it as a search engine of sorts. Like say they're in the grocery store, they see a product for the first time, they'll search for it on Amazon and just to check the reviews because there's a, a ton of reviews, the star ratings, the comments. And I wonder how Shopify will compete with something like that in the long term. It's just kind of interesting, maybe on the sales side, but it's still driving a lot of traffic just to Amazon for that one reason. 
Yeah. Well, in, in the longer term, I've actually seen some recent studies that are at least people producing content that say the number one way that uh, whatever the youngest generations is called, I don't even know, Gen Z, Gen whatever it is. The, do you know how they're searching for things nowadays? What's that? TikTok. Oh, yeah. That is becoming their go-to search engine where they go to TikTok first to get reviews and stuff on there. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Shopify has an agreement with TikTok uh, to, to do cross promotion. So that is something that if that trend holds and persists might actually benefit Shopify uh, secondarily. That's very interesting. Great point. So a little bit more on valuation here. I know that you started it out just like me and by reading all of the classic investing books, researching Buffett and Munger and, and many others, there's this line that Buffett told our recent guest, uh, Brent B. Shore, a while back when he was having dinner with him, Brent was pressing him on his diligence process. And he kind of put his fist on the table and said, price is my due diligence. And that, that really stuck with me because it kind of resonated with what I had learned from Buffett, which was to buy a dollar for 50 cents, right? But interestingly enough, Buffett didn't make any investments at the lows of 2020 of the 2020 COVID correction and instead has been buying billions of dollars of stock worth in the last six months here, sometimes near these decade highs. So sometimes you have to watch what Buffett does more than what he says. And given his long time horizon for his investments, perhaps he is more knowledgeable given those studies we, we mentioned earlier, and perhaps he's even de-emphasizing valuation over time. What are your thoughts on Perhaps he's even taken your lead, Brian. So Buffett is a master. He, you, I've learned absolutely so much from Buffett, um, and he has so much uh, to teach. But I have learned that there are actually many different mindsets you can take when it comes to valuation to invest uh, su successfully. Uh, Buffett is the one that's often uh, thrown up. But I actually think that valuation and the mindset for valuation is really a, a spectrum. So on one side of the spectrum, think about pure value investors. That, that mindset is what Buffett said. Price is my due diligence, right? Uh, I don't care. The mindset is, I don't care what I'm buying. As long as I'm buying the thing cheaply enough, as long as the expectations are so low that um, I, I can make money if, if, if the price is right. On the exact opposite side of the spectrum is, is the way that venture capitalists invest. So people like Mark Andreessen, right? Mark Andreessen, valuation isn't even on his radar in, in many cases. The only thing venture capitalists like Mark Andreessen care about, what is the upside if I'm right? And what are the chances that I'll be right, right? It doesn't matter to, to him if he buy, if he overpays or overvalues the next Google. What matters to him is he buys the next uh, Google. So I think that a lot of investors are somewhere between those two extremes. And you can learn lessons from people that practice both sides uh, of the extreme. Uh, I myself started out far, far more on the left-hand side, on the side that was valuation focused and slowly over time, I've shifted more to the right and have become less valuation uh, focused. In part because some of the research and the findings that we saw, um, we saw, we saw previously. Uh, but I think that everyone kind of exists somewhere on this spectrum, and great investors exist on both sides, right? You have Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett on one side, and you have people like Mark Andreessen and David Gardner on the other. And then in the middle somewhere are some other investors like Peter Lynch and uh, Manish Prabhai and Charlie Munger. Etc. So I don't think there's any one mindset that is quote unquote correct when it comes to valuation. I think it really depends on the investor. I wanted to highlight a, an example that might surprise a lot of people about Ben Graham. And Ben Graham, everyone knows Ben Graham as the godfather of value investing, as you just kind of highlighted there. He had an average investment performance around 20% annualized from about 1936 to 1956. And the overall market performance around that time was 12.2 annualized. So he far almost doubled the market average. In 1948, 12 years after Geico was founded, he bought 50% of the company for about $712,000, which is about $8.5 million today. Let's talk about the valuation around Geico at that time. And how did this play out for Mr. Graham? 
Yeah, it's funny when when Ben Graham. Uh, I've also seen analysis of his uh, his returns over over time, and from what I ha- understand is that while he is the father of of val- value investing, uh, he was an extremely disciplined investor, and he actually broke a whole bunch of his own rules when he chose to make an investment um, in, in Geico. So yeah, he bought fifty percent of Geico in 1948. Um, for seven hundred and twelve thousand dollars at the time, that was twenty five percent of the his partnerships uh, total total assets. And I think he did get a decent deal on Geico, but it wasn't a Ben Graham cigar butt pay the cheapest price possible uh, deal. And the the interesting thing about that. Um, that single move is that uh, he bought it in 1948, and by 1972, uh, that position was a 500 bagger for him. So $712,000 turned into $400 million for for Graham and Dodd's uh, port portfolio. In fact, he made more money off of Geico than he did off of every other investment that his investment firm made uh, up, up until then. And he had this great quote that, uh, that, that, that I just love. He said, in 1948, we made our Geico investment. And from then on, we seemed to be very brilliant people. So even he admitted that a huge amount of his return and his performance was owned to essentially a single company. And the thing that I like to, to, to point out is Think back to that de- decision. W- was Geico a phenomenal investment because he paid a low valuation for it? Uh, no. Geico was a phenomenal investment because it was a phenomenal company that went on to grow like crazy. The thing that Graham got right about Geico was he bought a great company and he didn't sell it. So if you actually um, make the valuation that he paid far worse, if, if you if you 10 x the valuation that he paid at the time to acquire Geico, if he way overpaid for Geico at the time and he still held it, he still would have done incredibly well because Geico went up uh, so, so much. So I I love that example because he is like the the quintessential value investor, the literal literal, um, inventor of value investing. And yet he owes a huge amount of his success as an investor to a growth stock. Maybe Buffett's first uh, experience of a wonderful company at a fair price, you know, sitting next to Graham uh, later on. So, you brought up Mark Andreessen recently, and I thought this was kind of interesting because a lot of people think venture capital is a lot different than traditional investing because, hey, they're taking sort of a shotgun approach. They just need one bet to outperform everything else, to kind of 10x, to kind of make money for the entire portfolio, and they can let the other 90% fall away. But what people might not realize is that traditional investing is very much the same kind of thing. And there's some research that you've brought up here um, about exactly this. So why don't we talk through how the average stock tends to underperform the index? How is that possible? Yeah, one of my favorite studies that's ever been done was done by uh, FactSet and JP Morgan. It's this wonderful study. It's called The Agony and the Ecstasy. And it's a 30 plus 35 year study of the stocks in the Russell 3000, which essentially covers like 99% of the market cap of the, uh, the US stock market. And what they did in this study was they studied the returns of each individual stock and they found the broad distribution uh, of these stocks versus the, versus the index. One of the most eye-opening things about this study, or I would have assumed at the start, if you just said, what percent of the stocks beat the market and what percent lose the market? I would have assumed the answer was 50-50. Like that just intuitively makes, makes sense to me. What this study actually found was that 66% of companies underperform the index over, over time. And I think the number is 40% of, of companies actually suffer a quote unquote catastrophic loss, which is 70% or more, and never recover. So if you're going to be picking stocks, you have to know that two thirds of the time, the average stock, if you're just picking blindly, is going to underperform the index. Conversely, what that, that same study found was that 36% of the companies outperform the index. But the most important thing there is that 7% of the companies, only 7% of the companies that are out there, generate such huge returns for investors, are such massive winners for investors, that they literally drag the entire index 
higher. So this is very much the Pareto principle at work, right? The 80-20 principle, except for it's even more extreme uh, th than that, where only a teeny minority of, of companies, 7% of companies, literally account for the vast majority of the gains of the index. And I think that one reason that index investing works so well is this chaos is completely hidden from view. When you're investing in the S&P 500, the total stock market index, you're buy 40% of the things that you're buying are, are, are declining in value 70% and never recovering. Uh, however, since you're also guaranteed to get in all of the extreme winners, uh, that is the thing that drives the stock market higher uh, over time. So if you're investing in individual stocks and you feel like you're picking a whole bunch of stocks that have gone down, know that that's normal. I think this is a perfect segue into some stock picks here because I can't think of a single stock maybe a couple in the FANG category, but a single stock that pulls the market higher in an asymmetric way more than Alphabet, or I might just call it Google because it's a habit, but Alphabet. Let's talk a little bit about Alphabet. It's around 20% off. It was recently around 20% off its all-time highs. And the PE ratio is looking pretty tempting. So walk us through your current assessment of Google. So Google has been a core holding of mine for, I think, 14 years now, and I've never sold it. And it's one of my top uh, positions today. Uh, everyone knows what Google does. Google is a big ad company that owns some of the most valuable real estate in the world on, on the internet. And it's essentially become like a toll booth for, 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 for accessing uh, the, the internet. That still remains uh, true to its day. Uh, to your point, Google is at the stage when it is hyper-optimized for profit. So this is a company that the PE ratio is useful, except for there's a big caveat that needs to be thrown in there. And that is Google has investments in other companies. It's made bets on other uh, companies. Uh, a recent change, change to the accounting standards now make it so when those investments go up in value, Google has to mark up its net income during that time period. And conversely, when those companies go down in value, if their stocks decline in value, Google has to decline mark down its earnings over this time period. This isn't something that only affects Google. This affects all companies that make investments in other uh, businesses. For that reason, the earnings power of Google, the underlying business, isn't fully reflected in the earnings of, of the company. So you have to keep that in mind when you're judging this company's PE ratio, is that that E has some wonkiness to it that's causing it to be understated and overstated depending on the recent movement of stock prices. Uh, however, uh, when I think about Google, the, the company, uh, I still think that tr uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in ad spending is still done offline. And that, that, that spending is going to gradually come uh, online. Google has so many um, uh, amazing properties in its fold. Uh, to me, the crown jewel is, is YouTube. Uh, in fact, in my household, if you, if you ask any member of my household, we could only have one streaming service, what would we keep? In every single case, it would be YouTube, right? We all watch and love YouTube more than any other streaming uh, uh, platform. Uh, and I know that many of my kids' friends feel, feel the same way. So I think that YouTube uh, still has tremendous uh, upside uh, uh, ahead of it. And then you have to mix in all of Google's other bets, all the, the loon shot projects, none of which have really paid off yet, none. Um, but the company, uh, it's just a matter of time that one of them does start to move the needle uh, for the business. But even still, the company's core business is still growing at a double digit rate. What, what are we, 25 years later? Um, so I still think that the future for Google is bright and it will just get even brighter if one of the company's other bets pay off. Yeah, the, the trailing 12 months going back to 2020 is 37% for Google. <laughs> 25 years later, as you just mentioned, I mean, this is astronomical growth for such a massive company, a $1.5 trillion company. And this is really insane. And to your point about the other bets, there's a lot in there. There's Nest, there's DeepMind, which in my opinion is probably the most promising <laughs> bet just sneakily in their portfolio there. But they also have Waymo. There's a lot of promise there and, and many other things. The stickiness with Google, we've talked about on the show before, but it's almost unlike anything else I, I've ever seen. Walk us through a couple of the qualitative things you look at, because I found this really fascinating as well. 
things like employee ratings, insider ownership, management, what are kind of the, what's the scorecard you look at on a qualitative basis? There's a number of factors when you're investing that you have to, to keep in mind, or at least I like to think about. It's not just looking at the financials. Uh, to me, the financials are like a company's wake. It's the trailing things of what they've done. I want to see rapidly improving financials. I want to see profits. I want to free free cash flow. But that's not the thing that tells you what's going to happen uh, next. When it comes to what's going to happen next, that's when things like, do I think the company has a moat uh, matters? Does, does the company have optionality? In other words, is is it, is, there, is it actively developing new products and new services that could in the future open up new revenue uh, uh, opportunities? Uh, does it have low customer acquisition costs, meaning it doesn't have to spend a lot on sales and marketing uh, to bring in uh, new, new customers? Who, who's in charge? Uh, have they been at, at the company for a long time or they are recently hired gun? How much, how much um, uh, stock does the company's insiders hold? What do the employees uh, think, think, think of the company? Many of those things I just said don't matter at all if you're trying to buy Google for the next three months. Right? They, 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 they literally don't matter at all to the company making or missing its next quarterly report. Uh, however, all those factors that I just mentioned, I believe, uh, do really matter in the long term to creating a sustainable company that consistently uh, grows and delivers for, uh, for shareholders. So there's a couple of the um, attributes that I look for um, to determine whether or not a company is worth investing in. Another promising part of Google is its cloud business. And that's been burgeoning and, and expanding rapidly as well. And, and we saw this with Amazon just dominating. I mean, half of the internet kind of flows through Amazon AWS now. So talk to us about what to watch to your point about the rear view versus the dashboard here. What are some things you're watching just to make sure this thesis stays on track? Despite the fact that cloud and YouTube and many of the companies, other bets are still are, are very promising and growing very quickly, uh, there's no doubt that still the lion's share of this company's revenue uh, comes from its core search and, and advertising business. So that is still the lion's share of growth today. However, I think that the, 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 the search market that the company has is mature, although it is still, still, still growing. And the, the other services, namely YouTube and to your point, uh, Google Cloud, um, are growing fast enough. And, and are starting to reach enough scale to actually move the needle for, for, for the company. Uh, so last quarter, for example, Google recorded 69, uh, million, 69 excuse me, billion dollars uh, in total revenue. And, and of that, just 6 billion, quote unquote, just 6 billion uh, was from the company's Google Cloud division. But that's actually one of the company's fastest growing divisions, growing over 40% uh, during the quarter. Uh, and YouTube is also growing pretty quickly uh, too. So over time, my expectation is that the core search market continues to grow, albeit at a slower rate. But the other of the businesses that are uh, have more growth to them, YouTube and Google Cloud and the other bets uh, that we mentioned before, are going to pick up the slack to ensure that this company can continue to grow its top line at an acceptable rate. A couple of other things to note about Google is that its balance sheet is just pristine this is obviously maybe the best business model that's ever existed. And it just shows in the balance sheet. You can look at it right now, but there's $164 billion of cash <laughs> sitting on Google's balance sheet and only about $13 billion of debt. So that's something you definitely want to look out for. And just proving that it's got a lot of ammunition should things turn south and there are some opportunities for more acquisitions and to just keep building out that portfolio that should be creating the next few decades of Google's growth. And one interesting fact about Google is that since its IPO, it's gone up 4,500%, 4,560% at the time of this recording. So I thought that was pretty good, right? I thought, hey, you did really well with that investment. And it wasn't until I came across Axon and discovered this business and its growth <laughs> since its IPO that I said, Wow, my goodness, what an amazing company. So let's go over now to Axon and talk about this company that I believe that was surprising to me and maybe surprising to some of our listeners. Axon, uh, the ticker symbol there is A-X-O-N. This is a smaller cap company uh, trading at around $10, uh, $10 billion uh, today. Uh, you probably aren't familiar with the name Axon, but I guarantee you've heard of the company's core product, uh, which is called the, the Taser. 
So this company used to be called Taser International, and it is by and large a company that provides tools and products um, that, are the, that are making the bullet obs obsolete. So the company's core Taser product is used to, you know, get uh, for unruly citizens to get them down without having to, to shoot them. And then the company has also made a big move into the body camera market. So we've seen that police officers around the United States and around the world are now being required to wear body cameras on them that record what, what's happening. Um, Axon is the number one provider of, of, that, uh, of that hardware. But the thing to me that is so interesting about Axon, I generally don't like hardware companies, companies that make their money by selling products that are, have a, a physical component to them, because many cases, those products can be ob obsoleted or they're, 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 they're fashionable. However, one thing that I really like about Axon is that it's taking an Apple-like approach uh, to, to its market. What I mean by that is it's building out these products uh, to be connected to each other and to work together, and it ties all them together with software. So Axon has been investing in its own record-keeping tool and its own software as a service product, which it broadly calls Axon Cloud. And as police officers move uh, to this cloud, suddenly the company's Taser products and the company's body camera products now work seamlessly with each other. And all those products help to reinforce the other products, which makes this company's moat uh, even stronger uh, over time. And this company has been growing its top line at a very robust rate over the last five years. And if you believe that these products are going to become more and more important moving forward, and you believe that Axon has the ability to create even newer products in the next couple of years that we can't even imagine uh, today, uh, this is one company, an under the radar company that I think has a very bright future. Yeah, going back to 2017 to 2021, the Taser, as you put it, is is growing at 17% on average. And the software business, which is, to your point, the most exciting part of this business, has gone up 44%. So we're seeing really healthy growth there. And let's just talk about the TAM of this. But before we even do that, let's talk about the stickiness of this software. Because what's so fascinating to me is this idea that you're training all these police forces to have these cameras on their body. That is collecting valuable evidence, maybe invaluable evidence in some cases, and that lives on this cloud and switching to anything else would result in losing that evidence perhaps and, and re-teaching all of these police forces to use something different. So the stickiness factor is extremely high, but let's talk about how they're using that to even broaden out into other markets. Yeah, and it gets even better than that. For example, one thing that they're doing is they're tying their their camera in to the company to a police officer's holster. So if the comp if a police officer pulls its gun, the camera automatically turns on and starts recording. Uh, moreover, they can use their camera to get interviews from eyewitnesses around them, so that way they don't have to take physical uh, note taking. Uh, so they're really trying to minimize the record keeping burden on the police uh, on police officers, which I know is a massive thing. And to go even one step further, as police, uh, police departments around the United States start to adopt the system using Axon Cloud, they can securely share evidence with each, each each other. So I think that the cloud uh, software, as you, as you mentioned, is, is the fastest growing, is the kind of sneaky uh, secret sauce that keeps the rest of the company's products top of, uh, top of mind. But this is a company that is incredibly impressive, growing very, very fast. Very few other companies are doing what it's doing. And when you think about the nature of selling to police forces, right, you have to go through a very high bar just to even be considered uh, out there. So I really think that this company can be viewed as like the apple of police force <laughs> and it's it's actively moving into different markets too and similar to google amazing balance sheet 558 million dollars of cash and zero debt which you always love to see so i mentioned that it had an impressive performance since its ipo axon is up 21,480 percent from its ipo and it was in fact a micro cap i believe when it was First debuting, Brian, what was the market valuation at the time of its IPO? Yeah, this is the company that, you know, many, many years ago when it came public, which was 2001, uh, back then companies used to come public way earlier uh, than they did today. So this was a company that had a market cap of about uh, 
16 million dollars back in 2001. So good luck finding this company right back then, right? It was just so small. This would have been nowhere close to anybody's uh, radar. But that is a big reason why the returns of this business have been so massive is that it came public at such a small market cap when compared to the size of companies when they come public today. All right, let's jump over to one more stock here. And this one is also super exciting. This is very interesting because it's the first company to IPO with two female founders, which is just an interesting fact that it's taken this long to get a stat like that. But it's exciting to see. And this company I especially love personally. So let's talk about Figs. Figs is a fascinating business because I remember the first time I heard that this company was coming public, my immediate thought was pass way too niche. Uh, but the more I've dug into it, the more impressed I've become with this company. So for those that don't know, Figs is a company that makes clothing and gear aimed at healthcare workers. So it actually makes scrubs that are very high quality and it really seemed to be catching on uh, within its core market. Uh, one way to kind of think about this company is it's essentially the Lululemon of, of healthcare. So the company has a number of products that it makes, but its core scrub products are just more comfortable, more durable, and better made than traditional scrubs uh, can be made. And what's, what's really fascinating about this company is when you learn about the, the scrubs market, there isn't brand loyalty to any of the scrub makers. They're really all just like generic scrubs that are out there, and they're typically provided by hospitals or in some case by specialty retail stores. What's fascinating about Figs is it's actually actually done a fabulous job about building a direct relationship with each of its customers. So uh, the company actually brings, comp brings customers to its products through its own app or on its own uh, website, so much so that 98% of this company's sales are, are direct to consumers. So it's essentially bypassing the, the distribution model uh, altogether. And that does really interesting things to this company's financials. Um, for example, the company's uh, margins are much stronger than you would expect them to be. Their gross margin is over 70%, which is higher than companies like Nike, uh, for, for example, or Under Armour. So I really like that this company is going after the market by establishing a direct relationship with its customers. That's really hard to do, but this company is really doing that well. Yeah, and I first discovered this company through their COVID masks because they're just very comfortable and, and effective. And that just kind of provides an example of the optionality that's built into this company to your point about starting in healthcare, but there's a lot of ways to define healthcare. What are some other ways you might define healthcare? What are some other categories that this might spill over into? Yeah, this company started by going after hospital workers in particular, but they have their eyes on basically every other category of, of service providers that provide uh, a uniform. Uh, one area that they know that they're starting to move into in a big way is the dental uh, industry, right? The dental industry is another massive market. And my, at my dentist, I know for a fact that they wear scrubs whenever I'm, I'm there. Uh, so the fact that they're going to be making products specifically for that industry uh, does bode well for this company's uh, future. And they're also doing things like uh, potentially getting into to footwear. To your point, they have masks, but they do a really good job about listening to their customers Customer, which they can do so because they have that direct relationship with them, creating new products for their customers and then selling them directly. Another interesting thing that's worth noting about this company is up until now, this has been basically a North American story. 95% of their sales are in North America. Only 5% are, are international. So the company has done such a good job in America that I think this brand can translate overseas. And if that's the case, uh, this company should have a very long growth runway ahead of it. And yet another example of a company with a really strong balance sheet, 170 million in cash, zero debt, which we always love to see. You know, I noticed that your quality score on this was lower than some of the others. I'm kind of curious with this one, what might be dragging down the thesis for you to make it not as high a quality of business as you would rate it some of these other companies we've talked about? The thing that I'm still kind of pondering with figs is the strength and durability of the company's uh, moat. Uh, by and large, this company's moat is 
largely it's brand name and brand i think is can be a powerful moat when built up over time but of of the moats that i typically look for i would vastly prefer it's protected by a network effect or high switching costs or some kind of durable cost advantage or or, or some patents or trade secrets uh, etc so moat a uh, uh, brand i think can be a, a moat and i think that this company does does have it but on my, ch- my my scoring system that's one of the weakest moats that you can you can possibly uh, have now we've seen companies like uh, Nike uh, and, and Lululemon, for example, to be home run grand slam investments for investors, largely built on the strength of, of, of their brand. Uh, but that is one reason why I wasn't as high on this company initially. Um, but there's room for improvement, of course. And going to some of the metrics here, the price of sales at the time of this recording was, was pretty low. It's about 4.7, whereas the PE ratio was incredibly high. High, I mean, 75 or almost 76, which to your point is, is never a cheap metric there at that level, but it's this high growth stage we talked about earlier. So how much are you emphasizing valuation on a company like this? Given the, the range of, out, of outcomes here, and this is a company that actually is making a physical good and shipping it. So it's not one that's going to have infinite operating leverage and, and it doesn't have zero marginal cost of, of replication, right? So there is a cost for this company to set up in, in new markets. And for that reason, its growth rate isn't going to be the, the same nutty growth rate that we see for like software as a service companies, uh, for, for example. So with a company like this, because of its relatively lower quality score on my checklist, this is one that I am going to be more valuation uh, focused than, than I would be for other, other companies. Uh, but I think given the FIG's size today, this is a relatively uh, small company trading at just a $2 billion uh, market cap. Uh, for comparison, Lululemon today is a 42 billion dollar uh, company. So when I see that huge disparity, and that, that tells me that this company could have 10 bagger potential from today's size if it can ex- execute. So that's why I'm, I'm interested in FIGS today. It's a combination of, I think it's a quality business with a long growth runway, and its market cup is small enough to multiply. Yeah. I love the point there about brand and, and even product really, because you're comparing it to Lululemon. What's to stop Lululemon from just going into the healthcare business and creating these things? I mean, it's hard to say. There's this established connection with the customer, as you mentioned, which could get them pretty far. But going to that mode, it's it's really important to understand the competition because this does seem like a little bit of a weaker mode than some of the other businesses we talked about. So it's great, great highlight there. All right, Brian, you have been so fantastic and providing all this research and this analysis on a few amazing stocks that I know our our, our audience is going to sink their teeth into. So Thank you so much for being such a great guest and always providing such value for our audience. Before I let you go, I want to give you the opportunity here to hand off to our audience where they can learn more about you, follow along on your YouTube channel or anywhere else you want them to find you. I can be found on all the social channels. I'm most active on Twitter and YouTube. That's just under my name, Brian Feraldi. I also have a free weekly newsletter that uh, people can sign up to if they're interested. And you can find that at mindset.brianferaldi.com. Brian, thanks again. Excited to do this more and more. Awesome, Trey. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm looking for operating businesses now. My, my main focus in the funds is operating businesses that are throwing off free cash flow and are using it to make material buybacks. I like them when they're growing by themselves, but I like to see management exercising some discipline 